classic example, because I think it's good to give people examples. They came up with this thing called the Cement Max, and that's Maximum Achievable Control Technology, because cement companies were putting a lot of pollutants into the air, and they did, and you want them to get better. But they came up with something that was so strict that a number of the cement companies decided that they were going to have to close down, and a number of those cement companies were in Texas. So they shut down. Guess where they went? Mexico. Who said that? Uh, they went to Mexico. Now, i got nothing against the Mexicans having jobs, except that we regulated the cement companies. Some of them then moved to Mexico right over the border from Texas. What did we do to improve the air by doing that? Nothing. In fact, we might have made it worse because the, the regulations that already existed in Mexico were far less than regulations in the United States. So when you regulate something to the point that the companies decide they can no longer do business in the United States, they're going to do business somewhere. They just moved over the border. Because with NAFTA, they could take the cement and ship it over the border even though it didn't meet the EPA regulations. It couldn't be produced in the United States, so it was produced in Mexico. And all those jobs went to Mexico and left the United States. Uh, now, that didn't happen in all cement companies, but the ones that were close to the border, it was much easier for them to, to move than it was to comply with the regulations. And that's, a, that's what you've got to do, is you've got to have reasonable regulations that let people get the money that they've invested back out of that investment. You have to have a tax policy that encourages businesses to reinvest their money in the United States. And then you have to make sure that, that you're out there hustling to bring in those, those jobs. Most of the time that's done by local economic development folks, but a congressman can help by being available to say, yes, I'll sit down and, and talk with those folks. And I have done some of that. Okay? That's all I hand. Yes, sir? Uh, any new policies you want to talk about? Any new policies I want to talk about? Uh, I think the next uh, six months can be really exciting in, in regard to new policies. Uh, there are going to be all kinds of things uh, popping up. Uh, we're already working on some of those. Uh, I think we're going to see a repeal and a replacement of Obamacare. While Obamacare has helped and, and something had to be done, and while it has helped some people who were not insured, it has hurt the vast majority of middle class Americans. And as a result, we've got to figure out, okay, what can we do to help those people who previously were uninsured, but at the same time bring some relief to middle class America. That's a policy that I think is going to be a major shift. Uh, I think you're going to see some shift, I hope you're going to see some shift in research money for um, new forms of energy and new ways to use energy. Now let me, let me explain that. Look, if we can find a way to make solar and wind work efficiently, that makes sense. Right now, the only reason solar and wind are being used at all is because of tax credits. What we have to do is spend research dollars to find ways to make solar and wind more efficient. At the same time, we need to have what's called, uh, in Washington, we need to have parity, equality between research dollars for the new fuel sources, the renewables, and the old fuel sources. Because this war on coal and war on natural gas and war on oil is not going to work for us. It's not going to work for anybody in the world. I was reading an article the other day that there are uh, 780 some new coal-fired power plants being built worldwide and a thousand more on the drawing boards. The world is going to use coal. We have a lot of coal in the 9th District, by the way. Not up here necessarily, but in the 9th District as a whole. Remember I told you how big it was. So what we need is we need research dollars to find ways to burn coal more cleanly. Instead of trying to pretend that we're not going to use coal in the world, we need research dollars to use it more efficiently, more effectively. I visited last summer a Japanese uh, coal-fired power plant. Virtually no socks and no knocks. That's uh, those are pollutants. Uh, Mercury is way down, uh, and based on theory, they didn't have a machine testing it. But based on theory, because they're burning so much hotter, they're burning the coal at a higher temperature, far less carbon dioxide. Because if you burn more carbon, there's no carbon to combine with the oxygen create carbon dioxide, which is what some people are worried about in regard to uh, global warming. There are ways to do this. We're not spending sufficient resources and we're spending more on the renewables and not enough on the fossil fuels. We need to make those even and, and have parity because the world is going to use coal. India, as an example, is a, uh, an emerging nation. It's a huge nation. It's huge geographically and it's got a lot of uh, huge population second only to China, and some people think it's going to pass China uh, in the next few years in, in the population. They want to be, be energy self-sufficient. 
Right now, they only have one source of energy that they can produce themselves, and that's coal. So we're kidding ourselves if we think we get rid of coal, it's going to solve all the problems because the United States is not alone on this planet. It's not going to solve all the problems because the rest of the world is going to continue to use coal. And so if we want to solve our, our environmental problems, we need to find the solutions to be able to use the fossil fuel fuels that we can then export worldwide. Okay? Back over to this side if I can. I don't want to leave you all out. Just because you're over here doesn't mean you get to sleep. Somebody's got to have a question over in this group right here. Yep, you've already asked one. I've got to, got to get somebody else. I appreciate it. Yes. Um, how does like your kids feel about you being a congressman? You being away from home so much? Question is on my family. How do my kids feel about me being away? Uh, they don't like it a lot. I, I will admit. So what we try to do is we do a lot of quality time stuff when I am with them, um, and they enjoy that. Now they like some of the perks. Uh, I got some great pictures. You want to talk about it? My, some of my all-time favorite pictures. But I was talking about the White House picnic. I started late having kids, so yes, I'm I'm old to have young children. But I have a 16-year-old um, stepdaughter, 10-year-old, and 9-year-old boys. And last summer at the picnic, they're wrestling on the lawn of the White House, as kids will do. And I started taking pictures. Pop, 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 pop. And I had some wonderful pictures of them. Wrestling. So we try to do some, some fun things. I take them to Washington uh, for a week every year when they're out of school. Uh, and they just do what I do and go where I do. And most of the time it's boring, but they're with me. And that's, that's a lot of times what's important. Um, but it's hard on them. It's not easy. Uh, but they're used to it. And uh, when I was first elected, uh, that would have been uh, six years ago. So they were... I guess on election day they were um, four and three on election day. So they've grown up knowing that that's what daddy does. Have you, you asked a question. I'm trying to make sure everybody gets involved. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the question was. Is Donald Trump going to fix the lunches after Michelle Obama messed them up? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I will. I will certainly work on it. There have been some real issues uh, with the lunches. This is. We've been talking about my family. Some. This actually impacts my family. And I. I can't tell you all the particulars because my wife has handled all of this. But the way they do the lunches it means that my 10-year-old can't eat at school. He takes the pack lunch every day. He can't eat the, the lunch. He has a lot of food allergies. And apparently, because they don't let you do much mixing and matching, it means he can't get anything. Because he can have maybe one item on the lunch line that day. And I don't know, I can't tell you all the particulars. I wish I probably ought to be able to. But I can't. All I know is, is they tried to figure it out, and it was just too complicated, so he just packs. And uh, so we pack that lunch every day. So there, there ought to be something we can do. The goal was a good one, trying to make lunches uh, more nutritious. But when you know when you create other problems or when kids aren't eating the food anyway, then you just you 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 didn't solve that problem. Other questions? I'm going back here. Yes, sir. With the results the election, how is the Virginia state legislation going to respond to the Roe v. Wade case or the <laughs> Look, these are the these are the issues of the day. I heard somebody say, "Oh my God!" But the question was, "What are we going to do with Roe v. Wade uh, as a part of the results of the election?" I don't uh, I don't think you'll see any legislation uh, in Congress related to Roe v. Wade. Now you'll see some limitations on federal spending. We have those fights every year uh, because taxpayer. And I believe this, and this is the philosophy of most of the members of Congress, not all, but a, a majority, at least right now, is while abortion may be legal, that doesn't mean we should be spending taxpayer dollars to, to support it. And so there's always a few battles about money going into uh, Planned Parenthood or money going to support abortions, whether it be through insurance plans or otherwise, that is taxpayer dollars. Uh, that being said, uh, as Donald Trump said in the uh, interview on 60 Minutes, the Supreme Court has control of that, and I don't think that will come up for any kind of a new decision anytime in the near future.
So I'm not sure we'll have to worry about it. So it's not really in the hands of the states at all? Uh, at this point in time, it will not be handled by the states. That's correct, because the, the Supreme Court of the United States said um, in Roe v. Wade that uh, you could not ban abortion uh, outright. Now, there's some question about late-term abortions uh, in the Roe v. Wade opinion. Now, what Trump said was if there was a change on the Supreme Court, but I don't see that happening in the next five to ten years. If there's a change on the Supreme Court, then it would go back to the states. But you're looking at probably a five to ten year outlook. No matter how, no matter which side of the issue you're on, it's not going to come up really for probably five to ten years. Okay. Other questions? I do want to try to get some folks over here. Y'all just haven't been as active. Yes. The question is, uh, one, do I get to hunt? The answer is, uh, yes, I could, and no, I don't. Um, that is a, uh, I would like to go hunting at some point in my life. I just never have found the time to do it. And I'm, i got to confess, I don't think I'd ever be into deer hunting. It'd be turkey hunting that I'd want to go for. Uh, it's just something about it that, that's always been appealing to me, but uh, but one of these days I'll get around to that. So it's not an aversion to it. I'm not against it. I just never have done it. Other questions? All right, back up here. Ladies on the front row. Surely you have some burning questions to ask. Any of the hot button issues are fine. Trust me. All right. Yes. What made you decide to come to LA? The question is, what made me decide to come to Allegheny High School? Oh, your principal invited me. As a backdrop to that, or as a, as a background on that, uh, I have to tell you that I enjoy doing these. I call these high school town halls. Uh, I like to do them. I like to get out and talk to students. I like to answer questions that you all have, because in reality, what happens in Washington, D.C. over the next year or two will have a greater impact on your lives than it will on mine. When you start talking about national debt and uh, whether or not we have a strong military, whether or not we're still number one economic nation, what are we doing about economic development, all of that applies you know, greater to you all because I'm, I'm 58. So I don't anticipate retiring at 65, but my work years are coming. You know, I'm on the, I'm on the back side of that hump. Now, I want to live a long time. I'm, I'm really hopeful we'll find all kinds of cures for all kinds of stuff. So I can be around for a long time. But it's still going to, what we're doing in regard to cures for med, you know, new medicines, debt and deficit, all of that's going to apply more to your lives than it is to mine, and it's very important that we do that. And the first place I ever heard that was from my mother, who was a civics teacher. And she said, Morgan, if you're ever in political office, talk to students, because it's, it's about them. It's about making sure that the world is as good or better for them than it was for you. And so that's that's what brought me here. But the invitation was the, the perfect, the main motivator for today.